All right, folks, shalom and welcome to the Ishai Fleischer Show, broadcasting live from Hebron, Hebron, to the world. You're a part of it wherever you are. Shalom and welcome to one of my favorite places in the whole world, which is the very tippy top of Hebron. It has two names. It's either called, in Hebrew, Admot Ishai, but it's more commonly referred to in its Arabic name, which is Tel Rometa. I'm walking right now uh, next to thousand-year-old, at least, trees overlooking the tomb of the patriarchs and matriarchs. Really one of my favorite places in the whole world. And close by here is the tomb of Ruth and Ishai, which is one of my major projects, maybe my most major project that I'm working on to restore, beautify, and renovate uh, the tomb, uh, this holy tomb that bespeaks of the Davidic monarchy because of Ruth, the great-grandmother of King David, and Ishai, the father of King David, and it's here in Hebron, probably where King David has his, had his original castle uh, when he ruled here in, in Hebron for seven years. Right now I'm just walking a little bit uh, uh, to a place that is a little shady, and it's overlooking... Uh, the Tomb of the Patriarchs and the Matriarchs, the, what I call the Abraham over, uh, Overlook, the Abrahamic Vista. Vista. It's a beautiful spot. It really is a gorgeous spot. And I, I, uh, I know we're listening in radio, but if I could communicate to you the, the beauty of this place and this ancient city, it's just something awesome. In any case, um, well, there's a lot to talk about. And basically, Israel is uh, right now kind of alone in the United States uh, administration. And I don't want to say the United States because I don't think it's the American people, but the administration is making a lot of troubles uh, for the Jewish people, for Israel. Uh, they are slowing, I know from firsthand knowledge, that they are slowing down the uh, battle that we have at Shifa Hospital against the many terrorists there. And uh, it's only been a miracle so far that uh, more soldiers haven't been killed uh, because of this uh, uh, hand, hamstringing. Uh, but the hamstringing is not just because of uh, uh, America. It's because we listen. Uh, Israel listens and is, and is hamstrung by the fact that we have become dependent on, uh, on American arms, and that's a problem. That's what's happening here in Israel, and there's more terrorism these days. And I do uh, foresee that we're going... This is actually the first hot day uh, of, the, of the beginnings of the summer, and I foresee that we're going to have a hot summer. So everybody's got to get out there and pray for Israel and support Israel and strengthen Israel. Not only that, there's a lot of hate against Israel uh, in the global media and among stars and different people, and people have really taken the wrong side of this issue. And i got to you know, tip my hat to the haters of Israel who have done a great job of trying to portray Israel as a baby killer, etc. So we gotta, we got to fight against that. Uh, we got to fight against that with all of our heart right now uh, and fight for more Israeli and Jewish independence. One of the people that's been under attack and that has fought back, sometimes heroically, sometimes super heroically, sometimes less, but I think that he's a Jewish hero. Uh, I only mean less that sometimes he gets involved in, in issues that, are, that seem a little trivial and stuff like that. But uh, a Jewish hero, in my opinion, is Shmuley Botech. And you could say you know, a lot of stuff about him. Um, that, that he's, you know, a very, you know, uh, kind of outlandish and very public type figure, you know, a, a attention seeker. But in my opinion, he's actually an amazing warrior for Israel and he fights against the anti-Israel bias and narrative out there. And he's not afraid to take it on the chin, uh, to make a splash, but he's out there. And I see a lot of Jews that are, that are actually uh, turning against him because sometimes he says outlandish things or, or something that, you know, is not exactly to your taste or liking. But in my opinion, um, I have tremendous respect for his battle uh, for Jewish rights and for the Jewish right to fight against our enemies. And he takes on the liars. And I had uh, the opportunity to interview him, and it's on my YouTube page. So here's a segment uh, that I recorded with him reviewing his uh, discussions uh, with uh, Pierce Morgan on the Pierce Morgan Show and with uh, 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 Senk. Ugyar, who is the uh, founder of the Young Turks, and his debate there, I think, was powerful. And so here's a segment of myself talking with Rabbi Shmuley Botech about uh, that interview and also about Chuck Schumer uh, and also about President Biden and who these people really are and how they really see Israel and, and how we have to fight their biases. So here's uh, my talk with Shmuley Botech. A lot of heat coming from America towards Benjamin Netanyahu with Chuck Schumer basically implying that he should be replaced as leader in a new election as soon as possible. What do you make of that? Yeah, it's unprecedented. I, I think people need to understand 
what a giant deal this is. Uh, the leadership of either party, Democrats or Republicans, have never, ever broken with Israel. Chuck Schumer is one of the biggest supporters of Israel in the whole country. For him to come out and say, enough is enough, uh, you've got to turn around, you've got to call new elections, and Netanyahu is uh, damaging Israel uh, is an enormous moment in American-Israeli relations. And he's not alone. Thomas Friedman, uh, also an enormous Israeli supporter, uh, wrote an ar article in the New York Times saying that Israel is now radioactive. And so these are not enemies of Israel. And the same goes for me. Allies of Israel saying, please turn around because this is not good for, like, look, I care deeply about the Palestinians. I'm not sure that the Schumers of the world or the Bidens of the world have ever shown that. But all of us care about Israel as well. And this is catastrophic for Israel's reputation. And you do not want Israel to be alone in the world again. 21 thousand women and children have been slaughtered at a minimum now 1.1 million palestinians are starving as we speak now you must turn around otherwise this is horrific not just for those starving innocent human beings but also for israel itself rabbi smoli i mean you've been obviously extremely passionate in your support of what israel has been doing in response to that terror attack on october the 7th but Attacking Rafa, which is a refugee camp right now with 1.5 million people, the vast majority of whom are completely innocent people, many, many, many hundreds of thousands of women and children. This is going to be a catastrophe if Netanyahu goes ahead with attacking Rafa, isn't it? The catastrophe for the Palestinian people is Hamas, Hamas, Hamas. If Israel does not destroy the last two military battalions who are encamped in Rafah, who, without whom there cannot be more terror attacks, will have peace in the Middle East, it's a catastrophe for the Palestinians whose food was stolen for 18 years before this war by the leadership, Ismail Aniyah, who's worth $7 billion. Where was the outrage of Cenk Igor back then? How is it that these guys are flying around in private jets while the, the Palestinians were suffering for 18 years with no hope? This is not about caring about the Palestinians. It's about pure anti-Semitism. Let's look at March 14th, 2024, a date that will live in infamy in the annals of the United States Senate, where a Senate majority leader called for regime change of the only democracy in the Middle East. By the way, I want to congratulate you know, uh, Vladimir Putin, a real, real nail biter yesterday where he only won by 90% of the vote. Schumer did not call for regime change in Russia. He didn't call for regime change. Bashar al-Assad, Israel's next door neighbor who killed 600,000 Arabs. He didn't call for regime change in Turkey. Uh, uh, you know, my friend Cenk was born uh, in, in, in Turkey, where, where you have the Turkish tyrant Erdogan who slaughters and imprisons journalists. He didn't call for regime change in Turkey. So what does that tell you? What does that tell you? Okay, but so, Rabbi Shuri, so, what does that tell you? about the strength of feeling in America amongst senior politicians about what its great ally Israel is currently doing. Th their initial full-scale it support. It, tell, it tells me that President... It, it, you're, you're, it's, a, it's a fair question, uh, uh, Pearson. By the way, thank you for having me on again. Mm. It tells me that President Biden, who's a good man, but he's 81 years old, has allowed one city in the United States, Dearborn, Michigan, Michigan is the, is the critical swing state, where you have a congresswoman named Rashida Tlaib, who is a dyed-in-the-wool anti-Semite, not anti-Israel, anti a Jew hater. He has allowed one city to dictate the presidential election. This is all about presidential politics. And, and Chuck Schumer allowed himself to be Joe Biden's <clears throat> court Jew. They needed a Jew to get on the Senate floor and say that the people of Israel will no longer be a democracy. You know, to my friend. All right, let's, uh, let's get to you, uh, Shmuley. That There you are in Pierce Morgan. Leveling very intense uh, criticisms, first thing against, uh, against uh, Chuck Schumer for being the court Jew. And before we even go on to what's happening here in Israel and should we be fighting Hamas or not, what's going on with one of the leaders of American Jewry? In, in that sense, what's going on with American Jewry itself? It's, it was a shocking thing uh, yeah. that happened yeah. there on the Senate floor. Tell me about well, that. Let, let's just start with Chank for a second, because you know, right. this is the second time I debated Chank. And uh, right. the thing about Chank is 
that not only is he a real anti-Semite, because if, if, if you falsely accuse the Jews of genocide, which he does all the time, and he screams, you got to see some of the other debates. Stop killing the Palestinians! And you can see the faces he makes. He's a very unprofessional debater. And his whole strategy is to always accuse someone else of ad hominem attacks while he makes eyebrows and threatens to leave the set. And he's very volatile. He's actually a lot of fun for that reason. But the problem with Cenk is that he's completely... He's an utter ignoramus when it comes to the Middle East. I mean, his 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 level of ignorance is breathless. I think I think that's a little bit more fair than calling him an anti-Semite per se. No, no, he, he's definitely an anti-Semite. I'll get back to that in a second. First, let's look at his ignorance. You know, when he when he starts by saying, and I, and, you know, we could pick apart the whole debate and show how ignorant he is. Both this debate, and the first debate I did with him. First, he says, "This America has never broken with Israel. This is unprecedented. This is a oh, really." The Eisenhower administration forced Israel to withdraw from the entire Sinai in 1956. I wonder if he even heard of Eisenhower, because you'll see in this debate later, he didn't know what the Civil War was. Let me repeat that. A candidate, a presidential candidate for the United States, Cenk Iger, Democratic, nom- you know, seeking the Democratic nomination, did not know what war I was talking about when I mentioned the Civil War. So Eisenhower broke with Israel. He wasn't very good to Israel. Um, Johnson warned Israel in the Six Day War, if you go it alone, you will be alone. And to Levi Eshkol's credit, he went it alone anyway, and Israel had its greatest military victory ever. George Bush Sr. famously, famously said he's breaking with Israel over loan guarantees when Israel needed so much money to absorb Ru- uh, Russian Jews, who would ultimately right now be under the tyranny of, of Vladimir Putin. You know, I could go on, let alone Obama and the Iran deal, let alone Netanyahu's speech before a joint session of Congress. This is the first time that Israel's right. broke the United States. Israel's not a vassal state. It's not the 51st star on the American flag. I love America with all my heart. But the reason I love America is that we love democracy. And Israel's the only democracy. So that's the first thing to chink. Total ignoramus. About the anti-Semitism, if, if he is not an anti-Semite, then it has no meaning. Because the number mm. one charge against Jews for which we have been decimated, slaughtered, defamed, burnt at the stake, and and uh, uh, and uh, sorry, and, and a genocide is that Jews are murderers. That you kill Christian children. That you that right. you drink their the blood. blood libel. You kill Jesus. He is the foremost, one of the foremost mm-hmm. blood libelers in the United States. First of all, what he said before, twenty-one thousand people have died. He makes up all these numbers. You'll see later in. The debate, I actually challenged him. He says that 12,000 children, innocent children died. I said, he said, and everyone reported it. I said, name one. He couldn't name one. He ultimately came up with the New York Times, whom I reminded, to its credit, always says that their numbers come from the Hamas-run health ministry. I tr- if Hamas told me right now that I had a beard, I'd, I'd go into to the mirror to make sure that it was still there. There is nothing you can say. Right. Hamas, you know what, what about Hamas? That they would say the truth. But maybe, maybe he's a maybe he's a light type of anti-Semite. Yeah, you know, whatever. Like you know, no, no. I'm saying, I'm saying. This is, not, this is, for, not for me to do like a like a gradation. All, all I mean to say, all I mean to say is that is that there's so. I mean, is he as bad as Khamenei of Iran? Probably not. Is he an anti-Semite? Absolutely. Shmuley, yeah. the, the point I'm trying to get to is that is that a lot of people who are fed lies through the media become anti-Semites. They become anti-Israel. There's a, there's a spectrum that's being pushed out there. I have been, I have been fed lies about black people my whole life that mm-hmm. that they that they uh, enact a larger proportion of criminality in the United States that they're that they're more dangerous that that's pure racism. I always knew it was racism. I've been fed lies about all kinds of people and I reject it. I've I've been fed lies. I'm sorry, a guy running for the presidency of the United States should be able to get okay truth. so he, he's an anti-semite but now let me now let me go to uh and i don't say that lightly he is an anti-semite now let me go to uh to 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 uh chuck schumer look wait let's let's play that segment just one second let's did we just play that i thought we just no let me, let me play chuck schumer for just one second because i want you to see yeah, yeah here we go the demands of extremists like ministers smotrick and ben gavir and the settlers in the west bank I have known Prime Minister Netanyahu for a very long time. While we have vehemently disagreed on many occasions, I will always respect his extraordinary bravery for Israel on the battlefield as a younger man. I believe in his heart he has his highest priority is, as is the security of Israel. However, I also believe 
Prime Minister Netanyahu has lost his way by allowing his political survival to take the precedence over the best interests of Israel. He has put himself in coalition with far-right ex far -right extremists like Minister Smotrich and Ben Gavir, and as a result, he has been too willing to tolerate the civilian toll in Gaza, which is pushing support for Israel worldwide to historic lows. I mean, I mean, right, that statement gotta, right I gotta, there. I, I, I got to jump in here. Yeah, that, that statement was bigger than, than Chanks. He, he just said that, that, that Netanyahu is willing to tolerate civilian death because of these right-wing ministers. No, no, he even said, he said, he said more than that. Look, Schumer's speech will, as I said, live in infamy. It will be remembered as one of the most infamous speeches ever delivered, not just by a United States senator on the well of the Senate floor, but actually as by the Senate majority leader, who is Jewish, who's using his- Very Jewish, Jewish right? Yeah. Like he's very Jewish. So let, let, let's look at, first of all, look at the contradiction, what he says. On the one hand, he says, I've known Netanyahu all these years, and I don't believe for one moment that he, that, that, that the security of the state of Israel is, I don't question that it's his highest priority. One second later, his highest priority is his political survival. <laughs> you know, you wonder who wrote this speech. His speechwriter should be fired on the spot. I, I believe that Netanyahu wouldn't do anything to compromise Israeli security, except save his own skin, and then he will compromise all Israeli security. So. Why did Chuck Schumer, who's a decent guy, why did he give this speech? It's simple. You have a man named Joe Biden who deserves a lot of credit for standing behind Israel for the past five months and for arming Israel. You know, we Jews believe in gratitude. I show the president tremendous gratitude. So what's changing? Biden is now polling five points behind Donald Trump. No one can believe it. Biden is in the fight for his life for the presidency for re-election. He's 81 years old. Uh, you know, on, on, on Inauguration Day, he'll be 82. And Americans really just don't want him, not because they think he's done a bad job. Even the Democrats who think he's done a good job, they just think he's too old. By the way, I think it's disgusting when people say he's senile and all this. It's not true. That's garbage. And that's, that's uh, ageism. I hate that. What is true is that Biden is showing that he doesn't, I don't know if he has the physical stamina. He has the mental stamina. I'm not sure he has the physical stamina to do this job. It's a tremendously, it's an understatement, you know, demanding job. But that's not my opinion. It's the opinion of 70% of Democrats, let alone, you know, the Republicans who don't want him at all. All right, so he's making because a fight for his that, life. Okay. Because of that, he's in the fight for his life. Now, there were only seven states. There used to be 22 states that were swing states. Let's say back in 2000 when President George W. Bush ran against Al Gore. There's now only seven swing states. And Michigan is critical. You lose Michigan, you've lost the presidency. And Michigan is controlled by one very an activist city, Dearborn, Michigan, which is filled with our Muslim brothers and sisters, many of whom detest and hate Israel. This is all about criticism from Rashida Tlaib, Ilan Omar, Dearborn, Michigan, and Michigan is in play. So, so I'm guessing what happened is that Biden goes to Schumer and he says, look, I can't give this speech <laughs> to save my own skin with Muslim voters and, and, and Michigan. Because that's the only place, well, there, Patterson, New Jersey, is a few other places where it, the, the Muslim uh, uh, electorate is very significant, right? In the same way that in New York, the Jewish electorate is very uh, significant. I can't give this speech. You have to give it for me. And then, of course, Schumer's dumb enough to give it, and that's why I said he's the court Jew. Schumer will pay a terrible price for that speech. Uh, he already is. He's being condemned by Democrats. He's, the only people endorsing him are J Street. <laughs> it was a horrible horrible speech. Now, let me tell you, Israel does not have to go to elections right now at all. So he's wrong about that. But I'll tell you who does. The United States has to have an election on the first Tuesday of November. And I, I hope, based on that alone, I really hope that the Republicans take control of the Senate just so Chuck Schumer is demoted. After giving a speech that was anti-democratic, anti-American values, opposing one of our, our foremost allies while it fights a genocidal war for its own survival. He deserves to be demoted. I hope he actually gets voted out of the Senate. I hope that a better candidate, he's not up for re-election uh, in 2024. But uh, if, if, if the Democrats lose two seats, then you're going to see, oh, it's not going to be... Uh, it's not gonna I, I, there's, there's one thing that you haven't said yet, which is, okay, th there was an anti-Israel speech. It was an anti-democratic speech. But the real injury was to American Jewry. Like this was a in our in our from from here the way it looked like is a decline of American Jewry 
And also uh, Pierce Morgan mentioned another American Jew of the same ilk, which is Thomas Friedman, uh, whom I even yeah, toured. Pierce Morgan mentioned that. Uh, what's it called? Cheng Iger. Yeah, yeah, I love that too. Cheng Iger said. And even Thomas oh, Friedman. Right. So pro right. <laughs> you, know, right. you know, when you do these debates, you know, the rank ignorance, you sometimes have to stop yourself from laughing because you don't want to disrespect your but, but back to my question, which is which is which is like there is a there is a degradation of what American Jewry is. And this guy is the leader, one of the leaders of American Jewry, and now he's telling us here in Israel, in the middle of a war, that our prime minister that we elected and his cabinet, which we put into power. Uh, is is not okay, and that we don't know what we're doing out there, you know, uh, from 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 Washington. He's and have an election in the middle of a war. I love that. Right. Divert all your the focus of your generals, of your lawmakers, of the Knesset, of the prime minister, and don't focus on destroying a a genocidal enemy who just murdered the American equivalent of sixty thousand people. Right. You have to multiply. But um, but no, go, go to elections. But but. But Yishai, sadly, when you say that this is like a shock to Israelis of the deterioration of American Jewish lobbying on, on behalf of Israel, that happened a long time ago. How did Obama pass the Iran nuclear agreement? Um, that happened a long time ago. The strangest thing actually now is that Christians are the ones who are the most <laughs> supporters. You know, Trump said, I didn't move the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem for the Jewish people, the Jewish vote, who didn't vote for me. He only got 30% of the vote. He said, I moved it for the evangelicals, for whom it's even more important. So one of the reasons the Republican Party is so much more pro-Israel today, and let me let me be careful when I say that, because I am someone who believes in bipartisan support. I do, I do not want to see the Corbynization of American politics the way we saw it in the UK. And I lived in the UK, where a died-in-the-world anti-Semite Jeremy Corbyn takes over the Labour Party, and suddenly, you know, you have to go to the conservatives. I want to see both part, and we have Democrats who are staunchly pro-Israel. Sadly, one of them today announced he's not running for re-election, um, and that's my senator, Robert uh, Menendez, one of the most pro-Israel senators, and he's been charged with corruption. Um, you have Richie Torres, a black gay Democrat whose whose love of Israel is is unflinching. There used to be people like Cory Booker, my dear friend, who was a brother to me, who then abandoned Israel in 2015 with his vote for the Iran nuclear agreement. But before that, he was very pro-Israel. I mean, I, I could go on. We've, we've given Sadly, we've kind of lost Corey, and that's that's a tragedy. Uh, much more for himself, because people see that he didn't have, have any real convictions that, and that political power and the search of the White House and whatever, and 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 uh, accommodating the extreme left progressive wing of the Democratic Party was more important than his convictions. Because the truth is that Corey does love Israel. He does love the Jewish people. He doesn't have, God forbid, an anti-Semitic bone in his body, but he just showed tremendous moral cowardice. But it's not true that we're losing the Democratic Party. It is true that the de that even staunch pro-Israel Democrats are showing moral cowardice and they are bending to the whims of the of the squad and the and, and the progressive and the progressive left. And if that continues, we run the risk of losing the Democratic Party, God forbid. And here I disagree with my colleagues of the Republican Jewish Coalition, you know, whose many events I've attended. And you know it's it's important to have the RJC. It's important to have the 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 equivalent, you know, Jewish Democrats who lobby for Israel within the Democratic Party. I don't want to see Israel become a one-party issue with one-party support. I will say that, sadly, it's going in that direction. Now, Biden... I just, I just want to tell you that from this yeah. side of the Atlantic, uh, we feel, a lot of us, that Israel's got to have more independence from the United States. It's not somebody... It's an ally, for sure, and a powerful ally, for sure, and many friends, and also American Jewry. But keeping all of our eggs in one basket is dangerous, strategically dangerous. Uh, and and well, suddenly supplies are cut and who knows what. And therefore, Israel's got to have some either both a more independence and also more diversity in weapons uh, procurement, et cetera. Yeah, Yishai, that, see, here, here's where you and I, this is a, a tough discussion. I'd love to, you know, you're a very- You got to remember, I'm, I'm, I'm here in Israel. You know, we're seeing it from a more kind of Judean no, no, you're, 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 a, you're a very thought-provoking person. And that is a very interesting comment. And it, it requires a whole other- um, podcast that we'll do together, believe another God willing. Let me tell you my problem with that statement. When you say Israel has to find other options, what are the other options? China? In, are India. The there are, um, India is not the United States. No, I... I no, it's I, not. I, but we have to, we have to diversify. We, you agree with me we can't be totally reliant. Can you, can you agree well, with that? Well, Israel is an autonomous state, so it should never, should never be totally reliant even on a, on a range of allies, even on a whole plethora of, of allies. It's an independent, sovereign state, first Jewish sovereign state in 2,000 years. Having said that, 
I believe the United States is the most moral country on earth, like Israel. I think that they, the two together are the most moral countries. I think the United States is the greatest nation on earth, the world's greatest superpower. And I think it is a, a, a nation firmly based on Judeo-Christian values and therefore loves Israel and stands united with Israel in terms of its values. I don't want to give up on this partnership. What I want to do is make sure that we American Jews do our part. You, you rightly say, where, how did American Jewry allow Schumer to say that? That's a great question. Why didn't we take out massive ads against him the ne very next day, calling for his resignation? I think, let me say openly right now, Chuck Schumer, God bless you. I know that you're a Jew who feels it in his heart. But if you don't repent of that statement, if you don't repudiate it, go back to the well of the Senate, we'll forgive it. You know, that's what Jews are. But if you don't repent of that, I believe that you should resign. I'm calling on you to resign. Not because you betrayed the Jewish people or the Jewish community. You betrayed the Senate of the United States of America. You are the third or fourth most powerful man in the United States. And you rejected American values. You rejected America's love for democracy. You betrayed an ally. And you betrayed your calling as a senator, let alone your constituents here in the state of New, you know, in the state of New York. So I think he should resign if he doesn't repent of that. And I think that the, that the Senate Democrats should, should kick him out um, from the leadership position. What are the chances of that happening right now? Same chances of my becoming the Prime Minister of Canada. But I will tell you that, um, that there is an election coming up in a few months. And if just two seats take, change hand, Chuck Schumer will be demoted automatically. And don't think that he isn't going to pay a price for that speech because Americans are a moral nation. Our disappointment was, as I said, it was, to me at least anyway, was a sense of this is where American Jewry is at. And, and it was just like this like moment of like a, a certain kind of old paternalism. Uh, he's telling us what to do. Also, also there's, this, there's, there's another thing which, which is a, a kind of line that's being drawn all the time, but it's very subtle, which is Netanyahu has taken these cabinet members and they're not okay and therefore he's bad. Yeah. And there's yeah. an erasure of the simple fact that the people of Israel, the majority of Israelis, voted for these parties. We voted for Ben Gvir and Smith. Right, right. And you know, and I appreciate that you came back. We lost you for a second. I appreciate that. Let's just, I, I want to really just talk about one last thing. In parentheses, before we go on, I just want to say that I don't exactly agree with you about the issue of who is Joe Biden. To me, Joe Biden is a guy that has been uh, for a long time trying to shrink Israel trying to weaken Israel and, and Obama's, Obama's presidency that, that pushed for the Iran deal had him as a vice president. And so yeah, look, look, he, not only was he the vice president, he sold the Iran deal, you know, but, but you have to understand, let's be fair here. I think we have to really be fair because the cause of Israel is justice and truth. Biden has been in the Senate for like half a century and he has been a very pro israel senator. I remember meeting him at APEC probably in the late 80s, early 90s, you know, several times and he was always warm and he was he he's always a pro israel. Whatever, who cares about that no, warmness? No, 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 but one second. Hang, 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 hang on a second. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Hang on one second. Give me one second here. Sure. You have to do you know, you said before about gradations of anti-Semites. That I'm not going to get into at least for now. But I will do gradations of Israel support. It was Joe Biden, Donald Trump? Absolutely not. But no one was Donald Trump. No one supported Israel the way Trump did. Was Joe Biden even George W. Bush? No, no, George W. Bush was a more pro Israel. But was he infinitely better than Obama? Absolutely. Did he feel as vice president that he couldn't make policy on his own? He had to be loyal to the president? Yeah, and maybe he was right. I mean, I can't argue with that. I will say that Biden went to Israel like five days after the attack, it was a war zone. It wasn't all that safe for an American president. And he hugged BB and he didn't make, you know, political stuff. And you can't forget stuff like that. Shmuley, I'm sorry. Israel. I love you. I love 95% of what you say, but that but, was a foil. That was a faux action. That was there, a bear hug in order to later on shrink Israel. He's an Israel shrinker. He's an Israel shrinker and in the power of armed enemies. I don't care if he hugs us at, at day number five. It means nothing to me. You are well, the one that say, gave the money. You say, when you say he's an Israel shrinker, you have to accept that there's two parties in the United States. The whole Democratic Party is going in the in the direction of Israel shrinking and, and, and the Palestinian state. I'll tell you something. One of the people who has emerged as the strongest pro-Israel candidates for the presidency in the history of this country is Robert Kennedy Jr., who's one of my dearest friends. I actually love Bobby. I don't endorse candidates. So I'm not endorsing him, but as a person, I love him dearly. Uh, he spoke at my mother's first yard site a month ago when we did the Torah for Shani. Look, he's a great man. Yesterday, if you saw this incredible interview he did with the AP, 
he said that most countries, unlike Israel, would have just bombarded Gaza into the Stone Age. But Israel is the most moral country and has not done so. And he also says that the Jews are indigenous. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that's exactly moral. Uh, uh, feeding our enemies, I don't think is exactly moral. Okay, but but, but 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 let me make this. Do we try but to be moral but, for but sure? Even, but, right. but even Bobby, but even Bobby says, you know, two state solution. And I've said to him many times, said, you know what I love about you, Bobby? You always speak the truth. I don't agree with you on on like the you know coronavirus vaccines, but you spoke your truth. You know that a, a, a two state solution is not only immoral because it'll just create another terror state. You also know, and you also know it's impractical. Inc. You know it's impossible. It's never going to happen. The Palestinians are never going to accept it. Israel's never going to do it. It's not, so. Why are you bringing up this over roasted false chestnut that's never going to happen? You know it's not a solution. So when you speak about those who want to shrink Israel, they're just using platitudes that they know are nonsense. The Palestinians had a Palestinian state. It was called Gaza. Israel withdrew completely and utterly. I was in Gaza City with um, with Al Sharpton in 2001. He went and had lunch with Yasser Arafat. I saw Yasser Arafat face to face. Everyone there, the Jews who came with me, said, shake his hand and go and have lunch. And I said, I would never do that. He has the blood of my hands on his people. What I did do is that when Sharpton came down for lunch and there were like 70 news cameras there and Sharpton did point out that I had brought him to Israel. So I said to Arafat, you know, you I wanted to ask him a question in front of the media. You know, you do all this stuff, this talk about peace of the brave, peace of the brave. But you, we know that you're the one who's funding the intifadas. You're paying the checks. So that's rank hypocrisy and murder. And he looked at me and said, you know, because of you, we do not have the peace of the brave, the peace of the brave. And by the way, I mean no offense to Yasser Arafat in saying that he was not, he did not look like Robert Redford. He did not look like Tom Cruise. He was not the best looking man I have ever seen. And I had the conscious feeling that I was in the face of true evil, a liar, a killer, uh, a murderer, the father of modern terrorism. And but when I went there, he ruled over, you know, he ruled over Gaza. And that was even before Israel's complete withdrawal in 2005. Even then he had, a, he had he had control. OK, but the point is we had a Palestinian state. We tried it. We called it's called Gaza. All and all that, ha that happened was is that a couple of Hamas leaders became multi-billionaires with investments in Turkey and Europe all over the place. And they're living. The, the amazing thing about the leaders of Gaza is that they are truly even you can't make this stuff up. That as you and I speak, and as their people are at war, and as we're told that the Palestinians are starving, and some of them are because of Hamas. And so while this is happening, these guys are in their hot tubs, in their spas, in their penthouses. You can't make this stuff up. I mean, even Hitler, may his name be erased, the, the most evil human being that ever lived, did not go to like some Swiss chalet for the for the, for the war. He went to you know his wolf lair, and he went to uh, he was in the Berlin bunker. What 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 the people the leaders of Hamas? Would, I've never seen anyone allow this. Like why didn't Hamas immediately say you guys have to come back and lead the war? Because they will never. They, they are just there to have the Palestinians die as a PR exercise against Israel and to steal all of their money, which is what they've done. I, I, again, I, I want to say to you that that to me, uh, President Biden is a man who has empowered Iran over and over again, which is the machine, which is the, the power behind the October 7th true. attack. That is true. That is true. And that, that means that he's a, he's, a, he's a friend of my enemy and that, therefore he is an enemy in that but sense. You can't, but that's still you still look. The and the point is, is that 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 big hug meeting was was not was not something that touched me. I'm like, this is a play. He said, let me tell you something. You know, the strange thing about Israel and American presidents is that sometimes the, what the people that we consider the worst presidents, and I by no means at all consider Joe Biden one of the worst presidents towards Israel. I do not believe that. But the ones who who were true anti-Semites, Nixon, we know true. We know that Nixon was so anti-Semitic that he couldn't control. He knew he was being taped in the Oval Office. And <laughs> half of the recordings is how much he hates Jews and how much Jews love money and how, you know, I mean, even Billy Graham is on was caught on tape speaking about demonic Jews in the Oval Office. But Nixon, but, but Nixon was willing but, to to. But help in 19, us. but in 1973, right after October 6th, when there was a Jewish Secretary of State who was a refugee from Hitler, 
but wanted Israel to have a bloody nose in the hope that if Israel lost a little bit of the war, even ultimately winning, they would be more open to peace negotiations. While a, while a Jewish Secretary of State delayed the uh, airlift of arms to Israel, it was that anti-Semitic president that called up Kissinger and said, where the hell are the arms? Do it now, ordered the Jewish Secretary. Then let's look at Harry Truman. Truman goes and he writes this in his, you know, he had a private diary. It was only published like 20 years ago. And he writes in the diary that no one is as wicked and as cruel and as selfish as the Jews. And then like, like he, I, I think I, if I'm not mistaken, please look, look us up afterward. I think he even said that even the Nazis have nothing on them for cruelty. I think he wrote that. So was he an anti-Semite? Sure sounds like it. We know his, we know his wife was an anti-Semite. We know that his uh, mother-in-law, but he was this, he called himself Cyrus. He, without his vote, there might not have been a state of Israel. So the point is this, I don't look at what Truman writes in his, you know, when, when all that stuff came out, I defended Truman. I said, a man has a right to be an anti-Semite in his heart. And I don't care what Nixon said in his private White House conversations either. I don't care about latent anti-Semitism. I actually think it's one of the biggest mistakes of American Jewry that they, they always want, they always say, let's make sure that anti-Semitism doesn't go underground. Let's make sure, you know, better to expose it. What kind of crap is that? I don't care about underground anti-Semitism that never harms me. Do I care if a guy hates my guts that he never harms me, never says it, buries it? What do I care? Okay. I care about all the Muslims in the United States. I should never say that because Muslims are my brothers, the Islamists. Let's not tar and feather Muslims, all the God-fearing Muslims. The Islamists who are fake Muslims, who Islamism is a political ideology with, with a thin veneer of Islam covering, just like Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam, which has nothing to do with Islam. I care about the Islamists who want to kill me in Times Square and told me that I should kill myself. I care about the Islamists who've attacked me, taking my kids, my grandkids ice skating three times. I care about Muhammad Hijab, who openly put pictures of my IDF sons, God forbid, Chas Hashan, God forbid, Khalil Vachas in body bags. I care about overt anti-Semitism. So if any of you who are watching me, who hate my guts, and you hate me for being Jewish, and you hate my Jewish nose, my Jewish beard, my Jewish yarmulke, my Jewish, my Jewish name, as long as you never tell me, and as long as you're not one of the thousand people every day on my social media feeds who tells me how much they want me to die and how Jews are all killers, I don't care. It's in your heart. Keep it there. <laughs> Keep it in your rancid, poisonous heart. Well, what if, what as if long that, as you never show it, I don't care. What if that anti-Semite that never shows it sends a ton of money to assassins, murderers, people developing a nuclear bomb, people who pay terrorists every single day? right? Uh, to the PA, to Iran. What if you just send money, but you'd give a big, beautiful, you know, car salesman smile. Hi, I love you. And here's the money to the murderers right behind your back. Then they are How showing about that? it. No, no, no. Then they are showing No, they're not it. showing it. They're just doing it. No, I'm talking about people who don't do, look, what I'm saying is Truman wrote in his diary that Jews are more cruel than the Nazis. Did that hurt any Jew? No. Did it, does he have a I was talking, it? I yeah. was giving you an example about President Biden who supports oh, sorry, sorry, our sorry, enemies sorry yeah 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 let me let me be clear biden sends the money to the killers biden's policies about iran have been atrocious not as bad as biden because sorry as obama because you can't get worse than obama's iran deal but he was second worst when it comes to iran that's pretty bad well, actually actually third worst because the worst of course the worst of course is someone who isn't and who was an anti-semitic president and that was jimmy carter a disgusting you know, it's hard. For, I, I don't like saying this because I saw him and he just lost his wife and I, my heart goes out to him and he looks so frail. So, you know what? Let me let me let me not speak that way about him. Let oh, forget it. Me. Forget let it. I can I can speak it. I don't care <laughs> about his frailty or his passed away wife. I could, could not care less. The guy hates Israel. He shrank Israel by 70 percent. He's endangered us. He's uh, the one that he's the one that lost Iran. I mean, he's the one that allowed right. the, the rock. He didn't support the Shah. And he allowed Khomeini to come to power. Right. And right. he's the one that allowed America to be held hostage for an entire year, which right. is why Hamas ultimately took the Israeli hostage. Carter is the one is the father of, of sadly of modern hostage taking, which keeps democracies Ouch. their hands tied so they can't fight back. He's the, the and let me let me just say, all of our you got a phone call? Go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Everything's good. Go ahead. Is that like your wife calling saying, Yishai, come for breakfast? Like, no, 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 no. <laughs> 
Shmuley, Carter, Shmuley, I'll tell you, Shmuley, I'll tell you what. Listen, no, no, I want, I want to say, I want to say one final thing. But I do want to switch gears, so let me wait, know. Wait, 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 wait. No, I have to say one final thing. We've been on the 51. So it's, it's almost two in the morning. There's one thing we we both have to say, both of us. I mean, Yishai, we did not talk enough about the hostages. Right. The hostages I was, have, I was, they have to be released. That has no, to be, they don't have to be released. We have to destroy the people that are holding them. They're not going to be released. We gotta crush those bad guys. We gotta starve them out. We gotta smoke them out. We gotta defeat them. It's not gonna happen because Mashiach is gonna come. We gotta take care of business. While we do that, we still have to demand a release. And why hasn't you know why? If we demand a release, that means there's a Hamas to release them. I don't want to demand a release. I want no Hamas at the end of this. No, no, release them and then destroy Hamas. But have them released. They have to be released. The hostages have to be released right now. This we, have to, we have to get them. We have we have to every second them. that they stay there. Jewish women are being raped, are being brutalized, and who knows what else? We know they're being raped. We don't even know that little baby. Is anyone feeding him? Is he still alive? They have to be released, and we have to destroy Hamas. And and Israel cannot leave Gaza. All right, we're back here on the Ishai Fleischer show. I'm still in beautiful Hebron. Walking around in some of the most beautiful places that just like the lookout on the tomb of Abraham. And I want to give you a lot of strength out there, wherever you are. <clears throat> right now is not the time to be down. It's not the time to be despondent. And not the time to be weakened by the hate. We got to right now be empowered. And I tell you that oftentimes in the Middle East, things are backwards from what they seem. Uh, Israel's being attacked, and yet Israel's learning to be strong again. Our army is dependent on, on, on American arms, but I think we're learning independence again. Uh, we had a divided society, now it's starting to unify. Uh, the hate actually breeds a strength. Um, and there's just a lot of good things that can happen, and I, and I foresee a lot of challenges, but also a lot of uh, uh, explosion moving forward, a lot of growth. A lot of growth, Jewish babies and Jewish land, and and, and Jewish um, Jewish Jewish strength is going to come through this war, uh, and that's the the irony is that October seventh was a horrific attack, um, and it and it weakened us and it weakened our borders, but we're going to get stronger through it. We're going to get stronger through it. I know it. I could feel it. And if you would know the people of Israel and the children of Israel and the young people of Israel, you would see that this thing is actually something to strengthen us. And God is talking to us and he's strengthening the Jewish people, which is an amazing thing. So uh, Baruch Hashem, uh, one of the people that I think that is a, uh, uh, a great uh, leader in Israel is, is Rabbi Amichai Eliyahu. He's a minister and he was on CNN recently. So here is my review of his video uh, and I'll tell you more in the review uh, and his fight for Jewish rights in the land of Israel and for heritage because he's the minister of heritage. So here's my talk uh, about Amichai Eliyahu. Minister Amichai Eliyahu is one of my favorite people in the Israeli government. Uh, he's part of a very famous dynasty of rabbis. Uh, his grandfather was the chief rabbi of Israel. His father is a much beloved chief rabbi of the city of Tzfat. And he is a rabbi and a minister of heritage in the country. He belongs to the Nationalist Party, Otsma Yehudi, and he's oftentimes maligned in the media. Here he is recently, uh, and it's a little bit rare because uh, he usually doesn't go on this kind of media, but here he is on CNN. Several ministers were present at the conference, including far-right heritage minister Amahai Eliyahu. In a rare interview with Western media, he tells us his political decisions are guided by the Torah. Is there anything about Gush Katif in here? Yes. Yes. And that settlements in Gaza are needed to prevent another October 7th. The language of the land says that wherever there is a Jewish settlement, there will be more security. Doesn't mean there will be absolute security, but there will be more security. Why would you advocate? Before we go on, I just want to say, what, do, what does he mean, the language of the land? He means really the laws of the Middle East, the rules of the Middle East. The rules of the Middle East is when you have a piece of land, you hold on to it and you defend it. If you show it to be uh, unarmed, unmanned, undefended, then other tribes are going to come and take it away and use that as a forward base to attack you. So that's what he means by the language of the land, the language of the Middle East. It's really the way things work around here. You have to defend your land. You have to show your presence. You have to make sure that you're staking your claim. And if you don't do that, 
Others are going to come and try to take it away. Okay, simple enough, right? For something that many would say is illegal, is immoral, is not supported by the majority of Israelis, and is also very harmful to Israel in terms of its international standing. Wait a minute, wait a minute. First thing, just, just there, was, there was like a little point there, not supported by the majority of Israelis. How do you think that this man is a minister in the government? How does that happen? Do you think we seize power around here? The people voted him in. The people voted him in, and therefore he's in that position. So therefore he represents the will of the people. But here comes somebody from CNN telling him, <clears throat> you don't represent the majority of the people. You don't represent even your constituency. It's just not true. It's just simple logic. The people voted him in. He represents the will of the people. And with regarding to what's good for Israel, do you think that CNN knows what's good for Israel? Do you think that the policy of land giveaway has been good for Israel? No, it has not. Okay, but she is sure uh, uh, with her line of questions that he's going against the will of the people and what's actually good for Israel. Let's see how he answers. Why do you think it's immoral to take land from someone who wants to kill me? Why is it immoral to take my land, which my ancestors lived there, which I've even given up, to someone who slaughters, rapes, and murders me? What is more immoral than that? Okay, so so that's a great answer. Uh, what's more immoral than giving away your land to people who hate you? But there's, a, there's even a simpler answer, which is, it's our land. It's just that simple. It's like, I don't even have to get upset. I don't have to talk about other people's jihad. It's just very simple. It's our land. And you have to hold on to what's yours here in the Middle East. If you don't do that, you signal, as we said before, you signal to the jihad that you're weak and you're, and you're willing to give up on, on, on basic things because you're willing to give up on the most precious of things, which is land. That's the way it is around here. Okay. Maybe in the West, it doesn't sound like it. Maybe it doesn't make sense to care so much about land. But even in the West, it's land is important. Everybody understands that. The globe is very finite. And this region is finite. And this is your land. You have to defend it. This is your home. This is the stuff of like the greatest gift that God gives you is your place is life. And then your place in this world, your land, your holy land, your beloved land. And everybody here in the Middle East understands that. But CNN doesn't always get that. Yahoo has called resettling Gaza, quote, an unrealistic goal. And most Israelis agree. But that hasn't stopped scores of IDF soldiers fighting there from posting videos calling for a return to Gush Katif. For well, thank you, CNN, for showing the truth that that scores of, of soldiers in Gaza. I mean, so we're talking about Israelis who had a regular life who are now like, I am giving up my regular life and maybe giving up my life uh, because I'm endangering myself to fight in Gaza, to fight the terrorists. And it's not enough to just destroy Hamas. We got to have justice. That justice is to go back to our land. And these soldiers are not only endangering their life, not only taking off from the regular life, they're also endangering their army career by making it clear to the world on YouTube and on clips that they want to stay and live in Gaza. Remember, Gaza is Jewish land that we gave away to the PA control, which was taken over soon afterwards by the Hamas in an idea that we would have peace if we gave away our land. Well, that was a failure. So here come Israeli soldiers saying, like, we got to fix that mistake. We got to go back to this land. And they're making these amazing videos. Now, look look at the picture that I'm showing right now. Look at this picture here. Okay, you could see it. It's just soldiers going with a Torah back into Gaza and being like, Gaza is Jewish. We're going to live in this land again. We're going to fix that mistake of the disengagement of 2005. Many supporters of the settler movement, what was once a distant fantasy is now a fervent dream. Clarissa Ward, CNN, in the Occupied West Bank. Now, you're not in the Occupied West Bank. You're in the liberated West Bank. You're in the liberated Judea. Okay? And look at this picture, you know? Uh, uh, this, is, this is Israeli soldiers saying we're not coming back until we destroy Gaza and we come back to live excuse me, destroy the Hamas of Gaza and come back to live in Gaza as a Jewish Gaza. Of course, minorities that want to live with us, that respect uh, our rights in this land, uh, that basically want to be uh, residents and, 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 and loyal and loving and keep their identity as whatever, whatever, whatever that is, that's fine, okay? There's no problem with lovers of Israel 
minorities living amongst us, just like we're a minority in this region. It's all about respect, okay? But let me tell you what, CNN, the will of the people is clear. We are going to fight this war. We're going to fight it until we destroy Hamas, even if they're hiding out in Rafah among civilians. We're going to deal with that. And moreover, uh, we're going to go back in the end to this ancestral land. And by the way, look at the map. You'll see Gaza outside of Israel doesn't make any sense. We're on the coastal line, and then suddenly there's like a tooth cut out of it. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. What makes sense is to defeat the jihad, go back to Gaza, make our life there, and continue to vote for people like Minister Amichai Eliyahu and his great understanding uh, of the language of the land. All right, we're back here on the Yishai Fleischer Show. Thank you so much for being with me. Uh, and um, our, we have, well, I'm going to go to Ben Breski in just a second, but before I do, I want to thank all the people that, that make this fight possible. Thank you so much for joining me on buymeacoffee.com forward slash Yishai. Uh, or yishaifleischer.com, helping me with my projects and the media projects, the YouTube projects, the, the, the restoration projects. Thank you so much. Thank you also to all of our sponsors, jewishpress.com for putting out our show, and jns.org. Thank you so much for your, uh, uh, your great efforts to put out good and true media, uh, jewishpress.com and jns.org. Thank you so much to the Hebron Fund. The Jewish community of Hebron is strengthened. I'm looking at it right now. It's strengthened through the Hebron Fund, Baruch Hashem, hebronfund.org. Sign up to one of our tours if you're coming this summer uh, through the one and only Rabbi Simcha Hachbaum. That will be amazing for you. And of course, when you're here in Israel, don't forego uh, a visit to Hebron, and don't forgo a visit to the Temple Mount, uh, which is found at uh, High on the Har. you got to get High on that Har, highonthehar.com with my friend MJ. Amazing work at strengthening our consciousness for the rights of the Jewish people in the heart of the Jewish homeland, which is the heart of the biblical homeland, which is, of course, the Temple Mount, where first, second, and soon third temples, uh, two stood, and one is going to be standing soon. Uh, thank you very much to our good friends at RetroWatchGuy.com. They made Aliyah, but they're still selling great old watches, refurbished, renewed, taken care of, and giving you time uh, in, in our lifetime, giving us a great, beautiful time. You know, time should be aesthetic. So that's RetroWatchGuy.com. And to our good friends at Prohibition Pickle, making delightful delights uh, in kosher style. And I had some delicious salami and, and pickles and great Ashkenazi superfood. That's right. It's the super kosher food. That's right. Super kosher food. Right? Uh, super kosher. Uh, and that's ProhibitionPickle.co.il. And last but not least, our good friends uh, at uh, Kosher Cycle Tours, right? So from kosher food to kosher cycle tours, you're going to need both of those. You need to see the land and get energy. Uh, and so Prohibition Pickle will give you the kosher and the cycle tours at koshercycletours.com. All right, uh, our, our own uh, intrepid and unstoppable, indefatigable Ben Bresky uh, has a history lesson for us about the story of Sharet Tzedek, one of Israel's premier hospitals in Jerusalem. It's got a long and, and amazing history. And it's one of the record holders for baby births in a year. So here's the one and only Ben Bresky. This is a moment in Jewish history. This week, I attended a Purim party at the old Sharet Tzedek Hospital on Jaffa Street in Jerusalem. There was music and people dressed in costumes. Just a week before, I was at the building to attend the opening of an art exhibit for the Jerusalem Biennale. But the building was used for quite a different purpose when it was dedicated in 1901. Today, the building is located between the Machane Yehuda Marketplace and the Jerusalem Central Bus Station. But back then, it was considered very far from the majority of the Jewish population, which was centered in the Old City. The story of Sharei Tzedek in its early days can be told through the lives of two people, the founder, Dr. Moshe Wallach, and the head nurse, Schweitzer Selma. Dr. Moshe Wallach ran the institution for 45 years. He was strictly observant, and the hospital today continues the tradition of upholding Jewish law. Born in Germany, one of seven children, he studied medicine at the University of Berlin. He moved to the land of Israel with the dream of building a hospital. Dr. Wallach was known for being strict with himself and with others, but also for his generosity and dedication. The historian David Yellen wrote the following about him. He did not spare any labor from his soul day and night to visit the sick and spend money from his own pocket. 
Dr. Wallach was determined never to leave the land of Israel because he wanted to be there when Mashiach came. But he decided to return to Germany in order to raise funds for the creation of the hospital. He purchased land in what was then called the Share Tzedek neighborhood. It officially opened in 1902 with 20 beds, an outpatient clinic, and a pharmacy, and was a 20-minute donkey ride from the old city. Share Tzedek was considered the most sophisticated and modern hospital in the area. Behind the hospital building, there was an area for cows, so fresh milk could be provided. Dr. Wallach personally supervised the milking to make sure everything was strictly kosher. He also insisted on Shabbat observance. In a nearby field, wheat was grown for Shmura Matzah. A sukkah was erected for the holiday of Sukkot with enough room for eating and sleeping. Dr. Wallach felt that Hebrew was a language for prayer only, and he spoke in Yiddish or German. When the Nazis came to power, he lessened the use of German. Dr. Wallach was a well-known and respected personality and knew both rabbinic leaders and Turkish and British officials. He worked long hours at the hospital and demanded long hours of his staff. He adopted a child left at the hospital. The father came from Syria riding a camel with a sick child. The mother had died. When the father never returned, Dr. Wallach assumed responsibility for her. Dr. Wallach never married. Once, a wealthy German donor to the hospital wanted him to return to Germany to marry his daughter, but Dr. Wallach refused to leave the land of Israel. He arranged for his brother to marry her instead. Whereas Dr. Wallach was known as a stern boss, his head nurse was known as a kinder personality. Selma Mayer was born in Germany and became known as Schweitzer Selma, or Nurse Selma. Dr. Wallach's two previous head nurses had left, one due to what she called the primitive conditions during the early years of the hospital. The other had fled the country during World War I. Dr. Wallach found Schweitzer Selma at the Salomon Hein Hospital in Hamburg, and she was hired under a three-year contract. She stayed at Shari Tzedek for the rest of her life, training and supervising all personnel at the hospital from 1916 until the 1930s. She lived at the hospital in a small room and, like Dr. Wallach, never married. Several weeks after her arrival, Jerusalem was hit by a year-long typhoid epidemic. Shari Sedek had 40 beds and added another 110 beds. Schweitzer Selma introduced European standards of nursing to the wards, including white uniforms for all hospital personnel, the changing of uniforms and bed sheets daily, and daily bathing of all patients. She outfitted personnel in overalls and hoods to protect them from typhoid infection. The following is from her autobiography describing the end of World War I. One day before the declaration of peace, the hospital was bombarded so much by the Turks that all the patients had to be transferred to the basement. There was no toilet and no washing facilities there. In any case, we had only cisterns for the rainwater, which was not clean and was only used for cleaning the floors. Everyone had a jara, an earthenware jug, with boiled water to drink on his bedside table. That time, we had to go to the basement on Shabbat of all days. How great was the joy when on Sunday the white flag flew. At once the patients were returned to the wards. Shortly after that, General Allenby arrived at our hospital in order to declare the peace here. Our hospital hall was the site of this historic act. He was then invited by me into the so-called salon, and tea was served to him and his aide. Dr. Wallach did not speak English well, and therefore the conversation was conducted in French. Immediately after the signing of the peace treaty, now, do not be too surprised, the Shari Sadek Hospital became a democratic enclave in Palestine. A cleaning woman with the beautiful name of Dudu sturdily stood up in the hospital's main hall, proudly tapped herself on the chest, and trumpeted with a raised voice, Now our time has come. The Englishmen are bringing us democracy. If you hear Dr. Wallach scream again, call me at once. And lo, it happened. He screamed once again, and dear Dudu came running. She, the cleaning woman, the leader of democracy, she went up to Dr. Wallach and said, Why are you screaming again? Who do you think you are? You, a shtickle of flesh, and I, a shtickle of flesh. 
You work little and earn a sack gelt, and we work hard and earn little. That is the only difference between us. We must scream, and you must be quiet. Everyone standing around was amazed at the courage of this woman. Only Dr. Wallach himself, to whom this was addressed, laughed out loud, laughed so heartily as I never saw him laugh before. We had electric lights at Sharitzetik before the city got any. The Solomon family from Holland donated a generator to the hospital in 1921. Dr. Wallach kept it for Shabbat and emergencies when the municipal electricity failed. Sharei Tzedek was often called Wallach Hospital by the Jerusalem residents. Schweitzer Selma described Dr. Wallach's strictness as well as his kindness. She writes, A woman was standing in the gate when Dr. Wallach was about to leave. She said, Oh, please, let me in for five minutes. I want to see my husband who was operated on yesterday. Quickly, before the crazy Wallach will come, let me through. Dr. Wallach replied, I'll take you up, but really only for five minutes. I'll wait for you at the door. After five minutes, he called out to her. At the gate, she thanked him many times and asked, What's your name? You are such a kind person. He answered, I am the crazy Wallach. In 1934, Schweitzer Selma founded the Sharet Tzedek Nursing School, which Dr. Wallach initially opposed because he was afraid they would not get any practical hands-on experience. But he was proven wrong, and the school exists to this day, with an award in her name. Schweitzer Selma relates another story. One day, a lady from Vienna, whom I had never met, visited me. She had been sent to me by the mayor of Jerusalem, where she asked for my address for the following reason. I have been commissioned by a woman whose sister was killed by the Nazis. She was married to a Christian. When her sister was being deported, she thought she would stay alive because of her marriage. Before being deported, she said to her sister, Here, take my diamond ring, and if I do not return, give it to a human being who has never married and has devoted her life to helping other people. This ring shall be a wandering ring, and the person who shall get it shall pass it on to another. With these words, she took a large, valuable diamond ring out of her pocketbook and handed it to me with her blessings. During Israel's polio epidemic in the early 1950s, Shari Sedek was the only hospital in Jerusalem with an isolation ward, and Schweitzer Selma trained nurses on how to use the iron lung machines. On the wall of her room, she had a poem by the famous Indian writer Rabindranath Tagore. I slept and dreamt that life was joy. I awoke and saw that life was duty. I acted and behold, duty was joy. In 1975, Time magazine profiled her in an article on Mother Teresa and others they called Saints Among Us. It reads as follows. Schweitzer Selma Mayor of Jerusalem, age 92, is also revered as something of an angel, certainly as a sadiq. She lost her mother when she was five, and as she grew up she became determined to give to others what I had missed, mother love and concern for human beings. Through wars and epidemics, she has been in Jerusalem ever since, always living at the hospital, often sitting up all night with a critically ill patient. She never married, seeing the care of suffering as her duty, but she did adopt and raise two daughters who had been orphaned like herself. In 1980, Shari Tzedek moved to its current facility near Mount Herzl, a state-of-the-art modern complex. The old building became the Israel Broadcasting Authority until 2017. Today, the building has been preserved and serves as a center for art, music, dance, Torah classes, and other cultural activities. This has been a moment in Jewish history. Thank you to Yishai Fleischer. Thank you to all the listeners. And Shalom. All right, folks, we're back here on the Yishai Fleischer Show overlooking Hebron. What an honor and a pleasure it is to be with you. Uh, and there's just so much things to, so many things to say. Sometimes I'm just like, what is it the thing that I want to say? Because there's so much to say right now. Because we're really alive. We're really alive right now. Like, I'm Israel Chai right now more than ever. Uh, so let's talk about the thing that gives us life, and that's our beautiful Torah, our one and only Torah. We have an amazing verse in this week's Torah portion. Esh tamid tukad al-mizbeach lo An eternal fire will be lit 
on the altar shall not be put out. And there's uh, halachic ramifications to what that verse means, that the fire should, go out through th- should not go out throughout the night. But I really think that the word eternal fire that will not be put out is really the message of the Jewish people today. And that's, that's, if, you need, if you need a little bit of, uh, if you need to understand what is it the message of the Jewish people today, it's an eternal flame. It has to be lit and it will, shall not go out. Uh, and that's what we are right now. We, there's many forces that want to put out that, uh, that fire. We will not let it. We will not let it be put out. We will fight right now. We'll fight. We'll also fight to, to better ourselves, to get closer to God, uh, to do His will. And, and when we think about Israel, I, I, you know, when we think about this whole story and the fight, we really have to ask ourselves, am I doing Hashem's will? Am I doing God's will? Am I living a life to do God's will? That's the kind of eternal flame of what it's all about. Because if you're just flaming out, if you're, flame, if you're on fire for yourself, you're going to flame out. But if you are lit from the eternal fire of Hashem, nothing is going to stop you. Nothing is going to, um, nothing is going to slow you down. Nothing is going to uh, put it out. And, and, and the opposite, all those forces that try to put out our fire... All those forces, they're going to actually make the fire stronger. That's what we have to be right now. We have to be a stronger fire, a stronger fire. And I know a lot of times I get letters from you guys saying, you give me strength. So right now, that's what we're doing. We're giving each other strength. I want you to pray for me, and I want you to pray for Israel. I want you to pray for the Jewish people. I want you to pray for the Knesset. I want you to pray for the healing of the soldiers. I want you to pray for the, um, uh, for the, for the, for the hostages. I want you to pray for a stronger Israel, and that, that we wisen up and that the, the, the bad leaders will take a step back to the good leaders that are coming in their stead. And that we pray for the souls that have been lost as well. Let's pray for all that right now. And let's act. Let's be on fire. Find a way to be on fire. Find any possible way to be part of it. We need all hands on deck. And remember, the eternal flame shall not go out. We have in every synagogue, we have an eternal fire. That's the idea. It's called a ner tamid. There's a ner tamid, which is a small version of the esh tamid. The, the eternal candle is a small version of the uh, eternal flame on that altar. That altar means that we serve Hashem. We serve Hashem. It's His vision that we are fulfilling. If it was you know, just up to us, we could live a life just for ourselves. Okay, you know, that would be nice, but then you come and go uh, in this world. If you are part of God's great vision... Um, it's not come and go. It's an eternal flame. And that means that the eternal energy, that you're part of the past and part of a great, you're part of an, a, a glorious past and, a, and an amazing destiny. Uh, you are part of it in your lifetime. You're a link on the chain. You, you are another log on that fire uh, so that that fire is eternal. I want to bless you uh, to read the Torah portion. It's Tzav uh, in the book of uh, Vayikra, which means it's uh, the second Torah portion in the book of Leviticus. And uh, if you are uh, Jewish, then Shabbat Shalom. And if you're not Jewish, then Shabbat Shalom. And bless you uh, from the good land to the world. We need that world right now to stand with Israel strong. The word need is not right. This is the opportunity. This is the opportunity to be part of a great moment. And it's exactly when the chips seem to be down, where the heroes are made, where memories are made, that you stood strong with Israel in this time, for a time such as this. If, who knows? Who knows? If it wasn't, it wasn't exactly for this moment that we've been born. God bless you guys from Chevron, and I salute the forefathers and mothers. And I'm I'm sending you through the waves of the podcast wherever you are. Blessings. I want to thank you, Chavit Seidman, Moshe Herman, Ben Bresky, Tabitha, and Lou for rocking my world and getting this show out to the world. Lots of love and lots of blessings from the land of blessings. And Shabbat Shalom.